In an earlier video, I looked at the system of Pythagorean tuning and showed how it was all based on the interval of a perfect fifth. In this video, I want to explain some of the problems of this type of tuning, which eventually led musicians to adopt new systems of tuning and intonation. And the particular problem I want to focus on is something called the Pythagorean comma. So, a quick reminder of how Pythagorean tuning works. It was discovered a long time ago and was certainly known to the ancient Greeks that if you stop a string two-thirds of the way along its length, in other words, divide it in the ratio 3 to 2 and pluck it, the sound is extremely consonant, which means it fits really well, with the sound of the open string. The system of Pythagorean tuning is built entirely on this idea that the interval of 3 to 2 should be the basis of all music. So we start on a selected frequency, any note we like, and move in perfect fifths. If that throws us out of the single octave for which we're tuning the notes, then we transpose by jumping up or down an octave. We can use the same principle to produce not only a seven note or heptatonic major scale, but also a chromatic scale. Now, if I choose to start on a C on the keyboard, and I just go up on the white notes from there, I can do a complete major scale just by staying on the white notes. I don't need the black notes at all. Now, that's C major. How about C chromatic? Well, that means we play all of the notes, including the black notes. So C chromatic would be... So starting from here, there are 12 notes before I get back to my starting point again. Now, this keyboard, like all instruments with fixed tuning today doesn't use Pythagorean tuning. It uses what we call equal temperament. So I can't play you a Pythagorean scale on it. If it were a synthesizer, I might be able to alter the tuning and show you the difference, but this is tuned to uh, equal temperament. One of the advantages of equal temperament is that you can play music in any key on the same instrument. Another is that as you move from one octave to the next, the tuning stays the same. For example, whatever note you start on, let's say I start on a D, it's going to sound perfectly consonant with a note that's several octaves higher. So for example, here's one that's higher, here's one that's lower, and here's one that's lower still. And if I play all of those together, they sound perfectly consonant. In the earlier video on this subject, I showed how to construct a major scale in Pythagorean tuning by jumping in fifths and bringing the resulting notes back into the same octave. Now I want to explain how problems with Pythagorean tuning develop when we look at constructing all the notes of a Pythagorean chromatic scale by stacking fifths, in other words, starting on some note and simply going up and up in fifths until we get back to the starting note, or almost the starting note, but several octaves higher. I'll be comparing the notes and their frequencies in equal temperament, shown on the left here, with the corresponding notes and frequencies in Pythagorean tuning. And we'll start on C1, which is the lowest C on a full-size piano keyboard. Every time we go up an octave, we double the frequency. And you'll see that that's what's happened here in going from C1 to C2. Now, in equal temperament, the tuning system we use today, every jump from one note on the chromatic scale to the next involves an equal jump in frequency ratio. And since there are 12 notes in all, that means the jump in frequency from the lower note to the next one up is the 12th root of 2, or roughly 1.059. Do this 12 times over, in other words, the 12th root of 2 times the 12th root of 2, 12 times in succession, gives 2, so that you've doubled the frequency in crossing the octave. And the whole system of equal temperament is based on this idea 
of an equal frequency ratio from one note to the next. Pythagorean tuning, by contrast, is entirely based on fifths, which means jumping by 3 over 2 or 1.5 in frequency time after time, starting from some initial note, which in this case we're taking to be C1. You can see that even after the very first jump to the G1, we're already a little bit different than the equal temperament for the G1. And the discrepancy between the frequency of notes in equal temperament and Pythagorean tuning gets wider as we go up. By the time we reach the end, the C8, the highest C on the piano, the difference is quite noticeable, both numerically and also if you heard the two notes played together. In equal temperament, we get back to a C that's perfectly consonant with the starting C, but Pythagorean tuning based on stacked fifths leads us to an end note that is noticeably dissonant. Another way of thinking of this is that in Pythagorean tuning, we end up on a B-sharp that's different in frequency and sound from the C, whereas in equal temperament, we finish on a B-sharp that's enharmonic, in other words, sounds exactly the same as the C. This small gap or discrepancy between two enharmonically identical notes, such as B-sharp and C, is what's known as the Pythagorean comma. It's roughly equivalent to a quarter of a semitone or half note. And although that may not seem much, it's very noticeable in practice, and is one of the reasons that Beginning in medieval times, musicians began to experiment with other systems of tuning in an effort to avoid the dissonances that Pythagorean tuning causes, especially when music started to involve a wider range of sounds, harmonies, and instruments. One of the things you can't do in Pythagorean tuning, but you can in equal temperament, is complete what's known as the circle of fifths. But that's the topic of another video in this series. So thanks for watching and stay tuned.